Today on a special episode of Collider Sports Time, the conference finals are set in the NBA. We got the Raptors taking on the Bucks in the Eastern Conference Finals, and then we got the Blazers taking on the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. We'll talk about all of that with my special guest, Adam Caporell, coming up after this logo. This awesome logo. It says Collider Sports Time. Let's do this thing. Hey, John Roca, the host here, joined, as I said, by Complex Sports Senior Editor Adam Caporell. I've been trying to get this guy on the show for weeks. Finally, randomly, he was able to come on today, So, and I appreciate it because we got a lot to talk about NBA. How are you, man? There's a few things going on in the NBA. Yeah. How are you? How you feel? How you feel about the playoffs overall as we're walking into I mean, into I these think, yeah, finals? I think we've had a really good... I remember last year's players were atrocious. Yeah. Um, and this year, the drama level's been ratcheted up, and we've seen some iconic moments, which mm -hmm. we really haven't had in a while. So, yeah, the drama's been fun. The pettiness has been percolating throughout the playoffs, which I, which to me adds to the drama level and why the NBA is a, a drama unto itself, unlike yeah. anything else on TV. And the play, for the most part, has been really, really good. And we've seen guys step up their games to new levels, the superstars that you want to see. And the other thing that's fun for me is that we're seeing some new blood really start to rise. Yeah. And, and because it's got, I mean, to me, you know, like the idea of seeing a Cavs Warriors finals last year, I was like done with it there after mm -hmm. four years. So I'm really happy that we're definitely going to get some new blood in the East and possibly in the West, although we'll, we'll debate that pretty quickly. But um, yeah, it's been a good run through the playoffs so far. Yeah, I've agreed. As, a, as an NBA fan, it's been a massive awesome fun run to the playoffs and you talk about moments you talk about young guys stepping up we got to jump into this game seven that just happened with the Sixers and Kawhi Leonard Kawhi Leonard winning this thing with one of those playground uh shots at the end that bounces off the front of the rim bounces straight up in the air does a couple more bounces and then right through the hoop and that's their victory incredible job that's what they got a guy like Kawhi to lead them it's because they wanted that NBA playoff experience to get them to the next level and look at that the Raptors who've been pretty much made fun of for years in the playoffs are now with Kyle Lowry still in this uh, Eastern Conference Finals against these Milwaukee Bucks. It's, it's just transcendent Milwaukee Bucks. But the young guys here for the Sixers, they really showed up. Simmons did his thing, and B did his thing. They took this thing to seven. They weren't consistent through the series, which I think was the difference. But the Raptors stepped up and did what needed they needed to do. What impressed you the most coming out of this series? Uh, I mean, listen, we can start with Kawhi because if you look at the numbers, um, his run through the Eastern Conference semifinals were pretty damn impressive yeah i mean the numbers he put up he had uh you know 33 points at least five of the games he had two 40 point performances i mean you can clown on him a little bit for the 41 points on 39 shots yeah that's incredibly inefficient that's kobe that's numbers like, that's not even kobe numbers that's like ai in a bad night numbers that's like just jacking 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 with that line drive shot of his it can be ugly sometimes but yeah. he had that iconic moment that goes down in raptors lore because no Raptors player in their 24-year history has hit a shot like that. Yeah. Remember, Vince Carr is probably the, the one Raptor had the big shot opportunity against the Sixers back mm -hmm. in 2001. Right. But Vince missed it. And who else is revered in Raptors history and lore, uh, you know, the way Vince Carter is? Right. Nobody. So, uh, you know, Kawhi had his iconic Toronto, his Raptors moment that no other player in franchise history has had. And I wrote, I wrote about this, uh, you know, earlier this week for Complex about how um, if you want to kind of, you know, play your amateur psycho analyst and kind of di di dive into the head of Kawhi, which is um, probably a, a fun house. Yeah. I mean, who knows what's <laughs> going on there? But, uh, you know, I kind of think that that moment um, gives the Raptors right now a little bit more of a leg up on the competition to sign him in free agency. And that's mm -hmm. a discussion for a different story for right. a different day or whatever. But, um, yeah, Kawhi's been incredibly impressive. I think the supporting core has been really good. Lowry's gotten clowned on a little bit here and there he for has. some of his performances. But that being said... You had a good, like, classic Kyle Lowry game that it wasn't too flashy, mm -hmm. but it came up big in big moments, had some good defensive stops mm -hmm. down the stretch, especially that one steal, that poke of Embiid. Right. That, was, that was huge. You know, so give Lowry some credit and don't clown him too, too much. Pascal Siakam obviously did what he <sighs> had done, and he should be the most improved player in the NBA as far as I'm concerned. He's been and the key, he's, man. he's kept playing extremely well in the mm -hmm. playoffs. So Raptors have a very good team, and if Kawhi can be a little more efficient against the, the Bucs, um, I, to me, that's kind of a toss-up series. Yeah. Um, looking at that, right now, the Bucks I think, are pretty heavy favorites. I think they're minus 300 for Vegas, mm -hmm. which is significant favorites. Um, but the Raptors are live underdogs. They have a great supporting cast. And, yes, dealing with Giannis is going to be a beast and a huge issue. It would be for any team. Right. But there have been some guys, if you look at the numbers, analytically speaking, of how they matched up with Giannis from the Raptors, whether you put Pascal Siakam on him, whether you put um, Kawhi on him. Yeah. Um, the one issue right now, or the one issue, the one little uh, person they're missing right now they love to have for the series would be OG on a Wobie. Yeah, on a Wobie. Um, yeah. the weird Indiana, appendectomy or whatever. Yeah, appendectomy has yeah. been out for a little while. Yeah. Um, his numbers guarding on is actually pretty significant mm -hmm. and pretty impressive. So um, there are a lot of reasons why I think we should be settling in for a drag him out, knock him out, seven game series. 
with the Bucks and the Raptors, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And again, yeah. New Blood, two good teams, I think, could give a good run to the Warriors, um, who I think we're both expecting to come out of the West, but we'll talk about that we'll in a few minutes. A bit. Yeah, but, but look, still, yeah, it's like it's, it's an evenly matched up series. Mm -hmm. You have two superstars, two top five NBA players right now right. that are healthy, doing their thing, and among the best players in the league. And yeah, it's like it's I'm 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 way more jacked up for what we're seeing in the East than I am for the West. Yeah, before we jump into the preview of the series here with the Raptors and the Bucks, I want to get your final thoughts on the Sixers here. They go out in the second round. Uh, I think sec uh, I think they went out in the second round second last year, year as yeah. well. Uh, but they they seem to find a little harder. They seem to be finding their identity piece by piece. But there was a little bit of unrest within them. You know, did Jimmy was Jimmy Butler really that last piece they needed or not? Tobias Harris was there, did his thing, but Jimmy didn't really grab the games by the throw when he needed to in the end here in game seven. I think he didn't do enough to, to get them over the line. Kawhi did. Do you feel that, or is Simmons the problem here? Uh, like, what, what no, do you think happens? There's, there's still, all right, so there's a lot of pieces that still have to kind of, one, have a full season to gel together with right. that with that team to, to really get and really know what you're dealing with. Um, now, if you look at them, that starting five, what became that starting five after the Tobias Harris trade, right. that was the second most effective and I think efficient starting five in the NBA mm -hmm. behind the Warriors. So obviously, analytically speaking, the Sixers did some really awesome things when everyone was clicking at the right time and right. all and all the cliches you want to use. But it's very difficult for those four guys and you add in J.J. Redick or mm -hmm. whoever else you want to piece in there to come together in a 25 game span figure it out and be on the same page and really elevate their games to a level when you've had you know teams like again the Warriors is the best example yeah. they can just do it so easy because they've been playing for so long together um I think you're gonna see a lot of upheaval you first do. and foremost okay the Brett Brown situation is um very interesting Brown remember was brought in under the Sam Hinkie or right. you know the regime and he's been there for six years mm -hmm. and six years for an NBA coach is practically an eternity these days nowadays there yeah, yeah. so there's like only a handful of coaches that have been with their team for six plus mm -hmm. years and Brown is like the anomaly where he definitely was in the hot seat number one because when you bring in those guys those those four all-stars for all-star caliber players to, mm -hmm. to start together um, you have really really high expectations and yeah. obviously the whole process thing went out the window real quick this yeah. season, and it's like now we're in a complete win-now mentality. We need to get the NBA Finals. We need to really seriously contend to get the NBA Finals. Yeah. Um, so what do they do with Brett Brown? New regime with Elton Brand running running things. Does he want his own head coach? Does, does the six-year you know time limit of, of your voice kind of just falling on deaf ears mm -hmm. um, you know, mean Brett Brown is out? I think Brett Brown's a very good coach. He's a lot of fun to talk to from the media perspective because he's very good at explaining things, very honest and very open. He's an intelligent and coach. It's, yeah, and, it's, yeah. and from, again, from, from being at Sixers games and covering them, um, I hope he continues. Yeah. Because to have a coach that that is open and honest with his um, analysis of what goes on, his decision-making with a top-tier team that's really fun to follow and, and to see what's going on, like if he does get fired and move mm -hmm. on, that'll be a loss for the NBA community that gets to cover and watch and see what they do. So yeah. that's number one. I think personally, I think Brown probably, they go in a different direction. Elton Brown wants to bring in his own guy. You think they'll go? I think they'll go in a different direction. Who's yeah, I think out they'll there right now? Even the Lakers were desperate to hire people and they could only get Frank Vogel. But you always, but sometimes you find, we can have a discussion on Frank Vogel too. We can have a long ass discussion on Frank Vogel. But there are always guys out there to, to yeah. bring in. And there's always mystery candidates. And the name that jumps out right now that's available is Ty Lue. And you can wonder if Ty Lue is playing the waiting game yeah, here because, because we've known that Brett Brown Maybe, is kind yeah. of hanging in okay. the wind and potentially ripe for getting fired. And if the Lakers, what's a better job right now, Lakers yeah. and Sixers? Oh, I'd take Sixers, Sixers in a job is a, Exactly, a much heartbeat. better job. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like the, Ty Lue is the name out there that um, is, is potentially out there to snatch that job and mm -hmm. a name that you wouldn't have that much issue with yeah. if you're a Sixers fan or just an NBA observer at all because Ty Lue has the bona fides and blah, blah, blah. So Brett Brown, I think probably writing on the wall, probably going to go a different direction. Okay. And then number two, what do you do with Tobias and Jimmy? Right. Um, you... Now, you can sign both of them. They would have enough hypothetical mm -hmm. cap space to sign both of them. But you'd be in luxury tax hell going yep. forward because you have Ben Simmons' contract coming up in a few seasons. Right. So the idea of keeping both of them for a four- or five-year max deals probably isn't feasible. Yeah. So who do you prioritize? I, I think you got to go Jimmy. Well, yes. Tobias, Jimmy, you can find. Jimmy right now is arguably a top – I don't think arguably. Jimmy's a top 20 player. You yep. can maybe make an argument if you want to put him top 15 or top 10. But Jimmy's a top 20 player. Yeah. I love Tobias Harris personally. Of course. He's a, he's a like, workman. He's a he, lunch no, basketball a, player. Tobias is a good, very, very good NBA player. Yes. And I've seen him work and knowing him personally a little bit, like I have an affinity for him yeah. as an individual, as a human being. 
but he's not quite on Jimmy's level and not quite right. overall talent level, of obviously, as Embiid and what Simmons potentially could be. So who's the admin out there? It depends on who the Sixers want to prioritize. Right. Jimmy probably brings a little bit more to the to the level because of his defensive mentality and being the elder statesman and, and all the intangibles that Jimmy brings. Mm -hmm. But Jimmy's also 30. Right. So do you max out a guy for five years who's about to, who's already age 30 season? Right. There's, there's a, who's like, played in there's a lot system. Of, yeah, there's a lot of weird things and a lot of tough decisions the Sixers have to make right. this offseason. And I don't, you know, and again, Jimmy's the natural one to latch on to and kind of uh, hit your wagon to, but maybe Tobias is better overall because you still need the outside scoring and mm -hmm. shooting. He's a little bit more consistent when it comes to that. And Jimmy, and even though... Tobias didn't have a great postseason. He still has a ton of potential, still younger, still, you know, he's a good defender and on the up and up and up, East Coast guy. Like, there's all these factors to weigh into. So I yeah. think, you know, if that shot doesn't go in for Kawhi and the Sixers win in overtime, yeah. uh, you know, again, writing about this for Complex, is like, you that was a historical... Um, bouncing four bounce of the ball that's going to irrevocably Switch change both. Yeah, yeah, it's going to irrevocably two change franchises. two organizations yep. because the Sixers have, again, if you start with Brett Brown probably being let go and yeah. then it trickles down to all these other decisions, if he wins and they go to the Eastern Conference Finals, much tougher to fire him and yeah. go in a different direction when yeah. he just led you to the furthest places you've been since the Allen Iverson days. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that that bouncing the ball and that and that break that the Raptors got from Kawhi um, is, again, the reverberations are fascinating. Hypotheticals mm -hmm. are, like, infinite. Yeah. Uh, but it's also fun because you don't get to do that uh, – with other sports the way you do with the NBA. Yeah, and I'm excited to see what happens with them because I've enjoyed watching Philadelphia when they've had all the pieces clicking. Oh, I, I love fantastic. watching too. And again, yeah. again, it's again their, their top five, their starting five is as talented as any in the yeah. game. Yeah. And again, when they've been clicking, which hasn't always been happened, right. it's been a struggle at times, but when they've been playing really well, it's like, damn, you guys you guys should yep. be in the NBA Finals. You yep. guys have that kind of talent without a doubt. Yeah, and we'll see what Elton Brand does because he's got quite a task on his hands. And remember, Elton Brand, you know, years uh, played for the Clippers and the Sixers. He's, he knows what it's like down there in the trenches. Can he be a good executive now, show what he's got, bring in his guy, keep the guys he wants to keep and build this team and take this team to the next level again? Because, look, they've done great work here with them now making these deals, but is it enough to get them to the next level? I would have liked to have seen Embiid Giannis final. That would have been fantastic. But yep. maybe it's just a year too early with Embiid and the injuries he's had to overcome as well. So we'll see how that affects things down the road for them. And then if you want to get spicier, <laughs> do you entertain moving Ben Simmons? Yeah. That's I, like, that's another layer of, right. you know, because, you know, Simmons, obviously we know how limited he is right now offensively. Simmons and should go to Lakers, man. <laughs> that's where he belongs, dude. LeBron well, I heard an interesting, him, but like I heard him. an interesting, uh, you know, uh, scenario yeah. um, today, just completely hypothetical. No one's really reporting this or saying that this is legitimate, but like, what well, if, breaking what news, if, man. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> not breaking news, but just strictly hypothetical. They've yeah. probably been bantering about on Twitter and, and other places <laughs> and other circles. But, like, what if the Rockets uh, inquired about Simmons for Chris Paul and some other pieces? Jesus, Simmons. Like, what with, about that? I don't, I, I don't know if Simmons I, does because he thrive in a in a in a. In a I don't know, but system? Simmons obviously has like you know the he knock on shoot. the knock on him right now is obviously there's still no jump shot after yeah. two you know two full seasons of the NBA, three years being under an NBA right. umbrella. All those guys um, in Houston can you, shoot. So it's like you know the questions are starting to you know whisper in. It's like is he lazy? Does he not want to work the way he wants to? But you see the talent, you see the brilliance of his yeah, game, yeah, yeah. and it's like yes, if you can develop this confidence that allows you to shoot in these big situations. I mean, it's insane that a starting point guard in the NBA today didn't take a shot outside of 12 feet in the postseason. It's insane that Philly brings these people in that do this. Marco Fultz, now Simmons. Like it's just it's just fascinating to me. Like what was the process all about? Was it well, just I mean, surrounding Simmons, you, I mean, surrounding yeah. Embiid with people who? But can't yeah, shoot? but I, of course you take like every every GM would have taken and Simmons in that position. Sure, of course. Now Fultz is a different story. We can right. debate that because we've seen what Tatum and other guys behind him have become. Right. But the Simmons situation. Philly had to take Simmons. Yeah, you have to take Simmons, but look what you get with Simmons. And he is he is an energy player. When he is dialed in, he is fantastic. That game six was incredible watching him kind of control that game for the most part and make those effort plays and those hustle plays that you, that are not consistent enough and you wish they would be with But him. he's also like a ton of basketball players because, you know, whether in college or NBA and you brought up mm. Markel Fultz, um, there are a million examples of guys that can do – what you don't see in practice yeah. and when the lights aren't shining bright when the cameras aren't rolling um and then when that time comes they're on the big stage yep. it's you know the confidence isn't there and they freeze up and we all have in some situation in our life no matter what so it's not it's you know sure. we're all we're all human to some degree but um it's a lot more prevalent than you think and it is perplexing that we haven't seen the development yet and maybe there's a fire lit under simmons this summer that really right. gets him in the gym and really jacking up these these shots but you know the people that cover the sixers on a daily basis and sixers people will you know tell you that ben can shoot yep and they see it on a regular basis that he can knock down threes and, and he mm -hmm. can be a mid-range guy and, and be a consistent score. 
but it's not translating to the games. It certainly didn't translate at all in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Quickly, do you think there's an issue between Brown and Simmons? Maybe that's the reason. No, I don't think, again. So it's just a matter of, like, Simmons maybe needing Brown has been incredibly honest, which is, again, great from the media perspective, guys that cover him, and he he hasn't, but he has reserved his calling out of guys and throwing people on the bus Mm -hmm. in front of the media, which is obviously conducive to offering or to, you know, sustaining your relationship with the players and being on their side. So he's been a good job. He's been a good job, Brett Brown has, of being the political guy, of playing both sides. He will call guys out to a degree when needs to be, but he hasn't been critical of Ben Simmons because um, when someone's obviously struggling with the confidence in that regard, you have to tiptoe around that that situation extremely carefully. It could go south real quick. Uh, All right, let's jump into this preview here. Raptors, Bucks, quickly. What is your feeling on uh, what's your initial th- feeling here? Do you think Raptors? Do you think Bucks? And why? I would lean towards the Bucks just because if you get Ma- Malcolm Brogdon back right now, mm-hmm. and with you know there, I think I think it was two two for the season series between the Raptors and the and the Bucks, um, and no one Kawhi didn't I think pop off. I've, uh, Giannis yeah. basically had his regular numbers against the Raptors. I think Kawhi roughly had his regular numbers against. No one was you know above and beyond their numbers in, in yeah. any game at least that would stands out at the top of my head. So you have a relatively even match series. Bucks obviously have a home court home court advantage mm-hmm. which matters and i would expect that you have a knock them out drag them like awesome seven game series mm-hmm. i could flip a coin and yeah and pick either team like i don't really there's not like i don't i don't have a spicy take for you saying that you know <laughs> raptors in five because You're of right. this or that like it should be a relatively evenly matched series you have two different you know dynamic like offensively what the bucks bring to the table is gonna be different than what the raptors bring to the mm-hmm. table and that makes it fun which you have a very different matchup and seeing these two teams going at it for for again six or seven games so um I don't have, yeah, again, I, if I wish I was coming to you with a spicy take saying that this is like going to be the X factor and, you know, someone off the bench like Danny Green's going to hit a million threes and right, he's the right. guy that you're not paying attention to. Or, you know, Brogdon injury is the one kind of X factor right now, ha- bringing him back into the fold where he hasn't played in basically over a month. We could argue uh, that injury and the Anobi injury. Both of them. Yeah, uh, they're very the, valuable. Yeah, yes. if, you get, if both those players come back for their respective yeah. teams through this series, it could change the face of this series completely. Yeah, so, I mean, you have two. Well, I shouldn't say complete because Giannis still has the one hole in this game where he doesn't shoot three-pointers. But you have two guys in Kawhi and Giannis that are alphas, and they Mm -hmm. have really good supporting cast that I think people don't give a, I think, the right amount of respect to. Yeah. I think still, for the most part, that the the secondary pieces, your Siakams, your Lowry's, your Greens with the Raptors, Mm -hmm. and then your Bledsoe's, your Brogdon's, your Middleton's, you know, who was an all-star this yes, year, still doesn't get the respect. And but and also Brooke Lopez, too. I think mm-hmm. most fast. I'll, here, here's, he's sure, he's here's, sure. here's one deep dive little matchup. Okay. I'll try to, be like, you know, be the smart, you know, anal, analyzer, expert, or whatever. So I Maybe the one here. matchup to really watch that could be really interesting and really um, and, and really determine a game or two mm-hmm. is your Paul, is not to Paul Gasol, your Marc Gasol versus Brooke Lopez matchup. Right. Because if you extend Gasol out to three-point line the way Brooke Lopez does all the time, and Lopez hasn't had a good postseason so far. Mm-hmm. Hasn't hit that many shots. If he heats up a little bit in the seven-game series or however long this this series ends up going, and you bring Gasol out and you have zero rim protection whatsoever, and Giannis can really dominate mm-hmm. and then just do the crazy things that we've seen them do during the regular season, I think the Gasol Brook Lopez matchup that on paper is you would see the two of them kind of guarding each other, facing each other. I think that's the one low-key one to really keep an eye on and yeah. see how that develops over the series. That's fair because Lopez has been out there popping trays and really redeveloped his game with that aspect to it over the last few years. It's been valuable to the team in that way. We look at Giannis. Giannis uh, Giannis is 27.4 points, 11.4 rebounds, and 4.4 assists per game in these playoffs. So he has been a monster. They figured out the Celtics after that second in that second game. In that second half, they figured out exactly how to short circuit the Celtics. Will they do the same with the Raptors? I feel like the Bucs are slowly gaining in confidence every round. People have been, people, including me, I doubted them saying, like, they don't have the postseason experience. They don't, I don't know what this coach can do with them. I don't know if the guys around them are going to show up because they're great in the regular season, but will these players really show up in the playoffs? And having that Brogdon injury, but they have proved me wrong and a lot of doubt is wrong will this and and the raptors have looked at times inconsistent so you walk into the series do the bucks seem the more consistent choice here and can they take care of business i'm starting to lean towards the bucks only because i have seen the bench for the raptors not shoot that well and i want consistently and i wonder uh especially with fred van Vliet, my god where's he gone i wonder if that's going to be the key difference here yeah the bench hasn't been as good as it was last year for the raptors mm-hmm. that i think that goes without saying and i would say the supporting pieces overall have been more impressive for the bucks this year yes. than what you have around Kawhi the Raptors right. but that being said this is still new territory for the Bucks, for all their players True. very good for Mike Buttonholzer mm-hmm. and again it's like do nerves and somehow and the big stage does that get to them in one game or one one scenario one situation in a fourth quarter whether on the road or at yeah. home 
Um, Which felt that way in game one of the Celtics yeah, series. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Raptors have been there. Kawhi's been there. Right. Now, we've seen the Raptors fall flat on their face plenty of times. And my, Kyle and probably, has certainly done yeah, that. Yeah, and probably the best thing for the Raptors is that <laughs> we've seen the typical game one, you know, uh, no-shows yeah, for them. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, at least it's on the road this time. You know, it's not like they're hosting the Bucks and they're going to have completely no-show after that <laughs> insane emotional lift-up that Kawhi gave them because if, if they were hosting game one, I would totally throw the rent money on the Bucks in game one because they're, they're just ripe for the most massive letdown possible. Right. And maybe going the road is actually a good thing for the Raptors and based on their notoriety and over the last, you know, three, four years, their letdowns that we, we see them have all the time in these game ones, especially at home. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the experience factor definitely is on the side of the Raptors. I'd say supporting cast and overall talent, I'd give an advantage to the Bucks. Mm -hmm. Um but again, it's like I said, like five or ten minutes ago, like you could flip a coin yeah. you know, a thousand times and, and and this is really evenly matched up. And I will say Bucks in seven very entertaining games. OK, I would agree. I would agree to a degree. I think Bucks in six. I think okay. they're going to figure them out of the Raptors out and just kind of slowly grind them into dust as they've been doing. They've been playing great defense, too, in these playoffs. So that may come into play against this high powered uh, Toronto offense. All right, let's move on to the Western Conference uh, here. The Blazers went on the road. They took care of business against the Nuggets. Uh, this was a really fun game to watch. They came back from, I think, 14 points down in the game or 17 points down against the Nuggets. Showed a lot of heart. These Blazers have been shocking the world since they walked into the playoffs this year. Having that Nurkic change, having him go down just a few games before the playoffs started, having Enos Cantor step in, and they've been doing it. CJ McCollum, Dame Lillard, Dame Lillard with that shot against the OKC Thunder to end that first round series and the look, everything he did here. But, you know, he kind of was off base in game seven. He, was, he didn't show up as strongly as he had in previous games. McCollum had to carry the load, and they took care of business against a, a Nuggets team that looked to be almost Bucks esque in their, like, who, can you believe in them or not believe in them? They had an opportunity at home to take care of business, couldn't get it done. Now you have a confident Blazers team walking into a game against, or walking into a series, rather, against the Warriors. Did you enjoy, uh, did, are you enjoying this ride with the Blazers? Yeah, I mean, it's fun. I mean, you know, it's, it's fun to watch... Uh, Dame Lillard, obviously, because he's a top five NBA player, yeah. should be all NBA for the season. And if you don't enjoy Dame Lillard, then I, you just don't enjoy basketball. You don't. Ex so thousand it's percent. like it's what that's what it comes down to. Like if you don't like, I like it more than Russell. Yeah, it's like you know Dame is is a chill guy, um, but just like is a killer on the court. And like yep. if you don't like love that, I like. I, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but yeah, I mean, game seven was a CJ McCollum game. Um, yep. For whatever reason, whether you know uh, Lillard was tired. Um, exhausted, uh, whatever the yeah. nerves, or just had an off game. I'll, I'll, I'll defer sure, to sure. off game because he was bad. Um, hit like one three. Yeah, I it mean, was the, terrible. That corner three was was important. Yeah, but like that's the only three he basically hit the entire game. And I think finished with less than twenty and just was uh, mm -hmm. struggled the mm -hmm. entire the entire afternoon. Um, it's a CJ game, and CJ performed in ways that I think a lot of people didn't expect, and he hit dagger after dagger yeah. after dagger mid-range shots were just like these can't keep falling yeah. and he put them in the eye of, of the nuggets so i mean you know nuggets obviously set into a level that they've never experienced before at least this core obviously so right. you know it's losing a game seven is tough um and you can maybe make a case that their top level talent is better than what the blazers brought but i'll make it easy contention that the blazers overall contingent of talent mm -hmm. um was superior and their supporting guys performed in ways that the nuggets uh supporting cast didn't yeah. and you know also, Nuggets were pretty awful shooting the ball yeah. yesterday, too. Yeah, so it's like, it's like, it goes back to like the Rockets in game seven of last year's Western Conference Finals. Like, you're going to jack yeah. 30 plus threes and make like five of them. Like, you can't, you're not going to win those games. Yeah. Like, you're that atrocious shooting. I don't care if you're, you know, playing at home or some other absurd scenario. Like, you're just not going to win the, you're not going to win the basketball game. I'm starting to believe in these Blazers more and more because they went and took care of business on the road at Denver. Denver, Denver had been almost unbeatable and there was, at home this and season. And there were some key defensive stops, too, down the there stretch, were. too. So it's like, on mm -hmm. top of missing shots, shots and, and the Blazers you know Lillard had some key steals McCollum you know got his hand in the yep. jar a few times here and there so you know give them the credit for being I guess a little more of the experience a little more I you agree. know having your emotions yep. in check and just being knowing about this you know knowing how to perform in that scenario when it was crunch time mm -hmm. whereas you didn't quite get that because I, there were a few sh you know too many shots the last like five or six minutes of the game that I thought Jokic like rushed a few shots yes. and there was just like you could you could you could sense and I'm sure in the arena even more so but like you could sense a hesitant see or like a helter skelter aspect mm -hmm. of them in their offense where it's like they just didn't seem to be that fluidity or that confidence in these yep. shots and they rimmed out and it was pretty easy to tell so you know execution you know defense and just straight up missing shots it doesn't take rocket science to realize why the nuggets didn't win game seven and mm -hmm. i don't think it's that big of a disappointment that they didn't win game seven again being that this is the first time this core of this young core right. having a run through the playoffs had a great season but 
you didn't, it's not like you get picked up like the seven seed. Like right. you lost to the number three seed yep. in a knock them out, drag them, very entertaining seven game series. That's been arguably the most even matched up series we've seen so far of these playoffs. And it's insane because not a lot of people are watching that series. That I know. Series it's easy, it's some easy of the to best forget because yeah, it's like, you know, Lillard, I've seen. Lillard doesn't get the respect that he should as a top, yep. you know, certain top 10 NBA player. And you can make a case now that he's inserted himself into the top five discussion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jokic looks like a, uh, like he's, you know, carving your meat in the deli. Like yeah. he's, he's, his body composition like screams butcher. Like yeah. he shouldn't be that good as an NBA player. Like he's like the doughiest center you've ever seen in your yeah, life. But true. he's incredibly athletic, makes these incredible passes, has the softest hands of like, you know, any person the NBA mm -hmm. has seen, or at least big man has seen in a long time. And, you know, Jamal Murray can rub some people the wrong way with some Jamal of his antics. Is, but he's Jekyll and Hyde. But when he shows he can, up, yeah, but when, he, God, when he's, he's on, I mean, he, it's incredible. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. you know, there's. He's only his third year. Nuggets and the Nuggets still don't have a massive identity, so a lot of people can't, you know, can't yeah. relate to them and can't really get on board with them. But yeah, it was a fun series that got lost in the weeds because you know Rockets Warriors are gonna, you know, uh, consume most of everyone's attention. Yeah. And you had big market teams over in the East, you know, it's dragging everyone's attention away. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't shocking to see that series that was the most entertaining seven game series mm -hmm. from you know from games one through. Um, get lost in the shuffle, but um, if you didn't see that many of them, then yeah, you missed out on some great games. I'll be honest with you, it's one of the series that I've watched every game, and then the next morning watch the House of Highlights 10-minute compilation of their games, because it's fantastic to remember. It's almost yeah. like watching a trailer again after you watch the movie for the first time. The shot like, making, the, shot yeah. making the drama was was high level, mm -hmm. um, much higher than, again, yeah. much higher than what we saw in the East between in those yeah. series, and certainly, you know, well, I'll just take that back. Rockets Warriors, I think every game was within a five or six points. Oh, yeah, so those, I mean, even though sometimes too. like the last minute and a half, like you had 11 point, you know, mm -hmm. uh, margins that kind of got whittled down through fouls and three points. In general, what you saw from the Rocket, from the Rockets, from the Nuggets and Blazers was consistently really, really good dramatic yeah. basketball yep. throughout those seven games. All right, we're looking at this and now the Blazers go on to take on the Warriors. I mean, you could argue that the Blazers have been kind of lucky this offseason as well in the playoffs. I'm sorry, not offseason, but in the playoffs because they encountered an OKC team with Paul George having some issues. Then they encountered a team in the Nuggets who haven't been there this far up yet at this core, as you mentioned, Adam, and having Jamal Murray be this Jekyll and Hyde type of player. Uh, and now they face a Warriors team without Kevin Durant at this point, without DeMarcus Cousins, who really was kind of a black hole on that team anyway, uh, and you've got them kind of coming back to that uh, Splash Brothers type of thing that they had before. Can this remain consistent? Because you've got two players that can match anything Curry and Thompson can draw up with McCollum and Dame Lillard. So this looks to be a more exciting series than people think. And maybe the Blazers might sneak this one out in seven. What's your feeling going into the series? Uh, yeah, I expect it to be a... I will still say the Warriors advance. Sure. Especially if you're getting Kevin Durant back for game, you know, right now. Which I don't believe, out. by the way. I don't think he's coming back. Okay. An, well, an, listen, an off ball injury, I just don't buy it. I mean, if you go by his history of calf strains and you go by the recommended, you know, time spent away, doctors mm -hmm. will say maybe a month injury or whatever. Um, so, yeah, he's going to he's gonna be compromised when he comes back. I think they're saying that stuff to keep it in the mind of the It can be, yeah. Blazers. I mean, sometimes mind games, you know, can be played and, yeah. and, you, and you have gamesmanship here. But if Kevin Durant's going to come back for games three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, um, I'm still giving the advantage to the Warriors. And I was really perplexed why people were so gung-ho about the Rockets um, being having this massive advantage yeah. once Durant went out. Like, I didn't get it because you we know texted about this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like you still like <laughs> the the one game the Ro the Warriors got off the Rockets this year was the one game Kevin Durant didn't play in Houston. Yeah. And the core of them, you know, the core of Draymond Clay and Steph performed in that game and they performed like champions yeah. as they are down the stretch. And perplexing why the Rockets lost that game for a number of reasons. We're not we're not here to talk about that, but like I was I was shocked that so many people were on the bandwagon of Rockets heading to that series number one. And number two, like everyone basically burying the the Warriors yeah. after Kevin Durant went down. Like I didn't get that so uh, you know if you look at top to bottom one through ten in the rotation who has the advantage of the top tier players the Warriors do of course mm -hmm. even without Durant right now and when he comes back it's even more lopsided yeah. but if you talk about players six through nine or ten in that rotation and your secondary players Blazers have better personnel. Yeah. Like that, the bench for the Warriors is just getting thinner. It's getting thinner than Kevin Durant's, you know, bald spot in the back of his head. Like it's just, <laughs> it's wearing down real quick. Like it ain't the same crew that it used to be. Yeah. Iguodala has given you moments here and there. But after that, like 
Livingston's not being the same is not the same player that right. we've seen in years past. Yep. Like you said dagger pull up jumpers, you know, mid range all the time, and he's barely getting any minutes. You know, even Iguodala is Quinn not Cook, I mean, you know, Looney's been very good. Yeah, you know, Looney's been good. but Looney's now has been inserted into the starting lineup. Bogut's, uh, you know, Bogut was great in the Clippers series, but you know, non-existent for the Rockets. So I have no idea right. how Steve Kerr uses him in this series. And then you go down the line and McKinney, Jordan Bell, and X, Y, and Z. It's like it's it, like the personnel for the Blazers with Al Farouk Amino, Rodney Hood, Myers Leonard. Jason Collins who had yeah. a really good series against the Nuggets. Yes, like they're playing much better and collectively as a unit, you can make a case that they are stronger personnel-wise than the Warriors right now. But I can't go against Clay, Draymond, Steph, and if Durant's say 75% mm -hmm. of what he is, mm -hmm. like that should be enough to get them over the hump against the Blazers. Yeah, well, you look at Durant. Durant's always been, in my mind, surplus to needs. Like they, they were oh, just. He's a, lu he's a luxury. He's a luxury. But, but again, as people pointed out accurately, and I'm not, I'm not. This is not some, you know, uh, astute observation on yeah, my yeah. end. It's like there are times they become way too reliant on him. Yes. Where it's just like, you know, the ball movement and the beautiful basketball that you see that you used from the from the Warriors several years ago. Yeah. Um, it's easy to give Kevin the ball, clear the hell out, let him do his yeah, things because no one, one can stop him. That's right. Because That's right. you get a little hezzy from him and he rises up and he's a gangly, you know, Tim Robbins towards the night before Christmas <laughs> monster that no one can swat and block. So it's it's very, it's it's so easy to get reliant on Kevin. They've done Tim, that before. And Tim they did Burton, it. I think you mean. Uh, Tim Burton. Burton. Yeah, what did I say? <laughs> Tim, <laughs> Tim Burton. <laughs> yes, Tim Roberts, yeah. Tim Burton, He's yeah, a Tim tall Burton. guy, don't get yeah, me wrong. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my Tim's mixed up there. But yeah, you get what I'm talking about. So it's like, we saw in the Clippers series where it's like yeah. no one was performing well, and they just gave the ball to Kevin Durant, and he basically got them over the, yeah. the, 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 the or, you know, over the finish line against the Clippers. So, um, you know, maybe without Durant and the practices and getting back into the flow of what was war what we knew as Warriors basketball before mm -hmm. he came into the fold, yeah. um, that's still a tough thing to defend and to and to. It's, I would argue it's even tougher. It can be, yes. And, you're you know, not prepared and Draymond for this. has been has had a very good playoffs. Yes, and, he has. You know, he's healthy and playing. You know, just being the ultimate pest and, and rebounding mm -hmm. and like basically a borderline triple double threat every single night, and. If Clay finally starts consistently popping off, which we haven't seen yet in this playoffs, yeah. and Curry's kind of doing his typical Curry things in the playoffs because, you know, historically, Steph hasn't always been the best performer in the playoffs. But, mm -hmm. again, we saw an all-time horrendous first half from him. <laughs> and they and still then you won saw the an all-time fourth quarter from yep. him. And yep. they still won the game. So it's like, you know, an, even an off night for the Warriors – collectively as a team, got them over the hump against what everyone thought was the best team to knock them off. So yeah. it's like, I can't go against the Warriors in a seven-game series against the Blazers, but I do think that it should be entertaining and fun, mm -hmm. and there's no reason why this series shouldn't go at least six games. Okay. I got I got the Blazers in a bit of an upset here because the defense okay. of the Warriors has been dropping. Like, they're at 12th right now in the NBA. Oh, no, I it's think not the same matters. defense we've seen in the years exactly. past. Exactly, and I think that could come into play against a, a high-powered offense like what the Blazers run, and I have a feeling that Cantor and uh, D Draymond Green are going to knock each other out at some point. There's going to be belt. There's going to be punches thrown. I, I think between Green and <laughs> Can Cantor doesn't take crap well, off I don't know about anybody. punches because punches would result in suspensions. Well, that would be I, some extra flagrants. There about will that? be. Cant Cantor takes no crap off anybody. No. And if Draymond starts his flailing stuff, claiming that he's not really trying to hit anybody, Cantor's going to take care of business in that you situation. Have two great you have eight a strong... trolls going against each other so like every that single helps. night. So yes, yeah. the 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 antics will be extra, and right. the anxiety and and the ability to get under each other's skin will be at new level so yes yeah. there will be some issues here and there at some point it's gonna creep they're in. gonna get tangled up there will be flagrants handed out extra yeah. technicals which always add you know to the mix but um I, taking the blazers i don't think is a huge huge stretch right. i would say a mild stretch and i think right now vegas has the warriors like minus, you know five to one you know uh, minus 500 right now yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think blazers like plus 375 on the money line for the series which is Pretty good value, but I just don't see it happening. Yeah, all right, fair enough. And the Warriors were, were uh, underdogs going into this Rocket series, quote, quote, unquote, underdogs, and they showed up because they don't like to be called underdogs. They fight their champions. You know, Rudy Tomjanovich said that, never doubt the heart of a champion. You saw them step up. But in this situation, they're in the uh, pole position, and you have the Blazers being underdog. I wonder how that affects and things. Other, you know, mentally. the other thing, too, it's like the, the one thing that ruins dynasties is ego. Yeah. And that may come to fruition this summer with Kevin Durant mm -hmm. and all the other machinations and Clay Thompson, you know. But for the for also, we talk about ruining dynasties. Ego, and so, ego I'm sorry. Ego can also sustain them because yep. those guys, when everyone's doubting them, you're Clay, Draymond, and Steph. Yeah. But everyone's like, you guys are about to be knocked out by the Rockets. Well, look what happened. Yep. 
like, you know, Ego kicked in and Clay had a pretty, a, a good game in game six. And Steph obviously got his stuff together in the third quarter and certainly in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And Draymond had a great game. So, yeah, you know, Ego may ruin them in the long run. But I think Ego also, as Steve Kerr succinctly said after the game, yeah. and, that, and, the, and that famous, you know, we were giants, um, paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like they, I think Ego kicked in. It was like, yeah. you know, we are champions, the Rudy Tomjanovich thing. Ego definitely came into play in game six and sustained them and carried them to the Western Conference Finals. Okay, we got a, lot, a few minutes here to end here. Let's wrap up on this. Uh, news broke this morning on ESPN that uh, John Bellin, the University of Coach, uh, the University of Michigan coach, is going to step in. Five-year contract with the Cavaliers. Um, a, do you like this hire for the Cavaliers? Do you think this is going to work at all? Beeline's been one of the most underrated coaches in college, and his ascension from um, basically nothing to what he is now is astounding. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, reading about this, which is amazing, he's never been an assistant coach. Yeah. That's incredible. That's like that's that's mind boggling. Like whether you're high school and he's been like D three, D two, D one, and he did a great job at West Virginia and did an awesome job at Michigan. Yeah. Like he's really well respected in the college ranks. How that translates to the NBA is always remains to be seen. But that being said, he's also known as being a very offensive minded coach. Mm -hmm. And certainly offense is the name of the game in the NBA. And if you have young players that Colin Sexton's and some other guys that they can buy in and depend on what the Cavs can get in the draft too, um, he's dealing with guys of age bracket that relatively speaking, yeah. he is used oh, yeah. to dealing Fair with. Point. Yeah. So think about that. So when you're trying to mold two top of your guys, Sexton, whoever they get in the draft, mm -hmm. and some other guys, and you having some key veterans like you know Kevin Love still around, Tristan yeah. Thompson. Um, JR probably will find, you know, new digs this you gotta summertime. You got to get rid of JR, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, not maybe a huge stretch for Beeline to stick in a, in a, you know, I guess Cleveland counts as, well, West Belt, Midwestern City, yeah, whatever. But, like, his blue collar, like, Beeline is a typical blue-collar coach. Mm -hmm. So he's going to fit in really well in Cleveland. And does his hiring mean there's some going to be renaissance in Cleveland? No, but, I mean, why not try something and go a different direction? Yeah. And Kobe Altman, you know, putting his stamp on the organization with LeBron fully in the rearview mirror and going a little bit outside, not completely outside the box, but you have a guy that, again, well-respected within the coaching mm -hmm. ranks, mm -hmm. has a track record, track record of success every single place he's gone, and with offensive minded, like, why the hell not? Yeah, you got to make it attractive to come to Cleveland. Certainly, uh, Beeline does that. You're not bringing so Ty Lue back. Again, if Ty yeah. Lue's the best available coach out there, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, your, your options are kind of limited. So, again, slightly thinking out of the box, um, mm -hmm. but I can't, I can't knock it right now. I don't, it's, okay. it's, it's tough not to, it's tough to knock it. I'm excited about it. We'll see what happens. It's as different. It goes yeah, up. I mean, yeah, it's, I like it. It's you one know, of those college Billy, coaches I'm like, excited. Billy Donovan's lasted the hell and been mm. much better sure. with, the, with the Thunder. Than I ever thought. So yeah. you know, Beeline is 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 subdued, but you know, still intense. And again, yep. he's has a track record of getting stuff out of these guys. Hasn't always necessarily had the most talented guys in his team, especially his West Virginia teams back. You know, when mm -hmm. they were still in the Big East. Um, so yeah, Beeline. You know, put some respect in his name. He has a record of, uh, or history rather, of making the most of what he's got and bringing out and bringing them to levels that maybe they didn't even know they could do. So that's going to be fun. Although to see I would say five-year deals is a is a long deal. It's an and, interesting and deal. And you know, you know, it's like Beeline doesn't have the track record of a Tom Izzo, who every few years we hear about right. some NBA team seriously going after, and Izzo kind of giving a you know thought to it. But at the same time with a man of his accolades and his background, you can't give him a three-year deal because yeah. he's never going to accept that. Exactly. So it's like he had a really good thing going at Michigan. I'm actually surprised he left there just Me because too. Michigan's been excellent under his mm -hmm. under his leadership. Consistently um, a Final Four candidate. Yeah, but, you know, five-year deal, again, trying something different yeah. and track record, sure. Okay, one last thing as we wrap up. Do you buy these rumors that are now starting, like Stephen Smith, Stephen A. Smith's tweet the other day, 95% sure that Kyrie and uh, Kevin Durant are going to New York. Do you think that's real? <laughs> <laughs> I have sports time. Yeah. Do you think that's um, real? Again, the the uh, we, talk, <laughs> we talked about yeah, talk about trying to psychoanalyze Kawhi Leonard. Like it's oh, just yeah. tough trying to psychoanalyze KD. Kyrie and KD yeah. because the two of them can be as miserable as humanly possible. Do at you times. think the Ty Lue thing is real? That Kyrie and Ty Lue didn't get along, which is why he didn't go. Home I never heard that before from okay. people, and I wasn't around the Cavs that much, mostly just around the playoff yeah, time. Yeah, never, never hinted at it. Even never, but I articles. never remember reading that and yeah. that being a dominant theme and narrative around the two of them that, listen, again, Kyrie's a complicated individual right. and thought that he was ready to be, you know, An the alpha, alpha mm -hmm. and we're pro it's proving that maybe he's not quite built for that. So um, as hard. a Knicks fan, yeah. it's certainly enticing and, like, really, like, <laughs> yeah, like you want to start drooling, like, the idea. I don't know if I quite buy it just because of how, um, you know, and crazy not the right word, but like we just seriously don't know what Kyrie's thinking right now. Okay. And just now, obviously, every indication, everyone is reporting that Durant to New York is a done deal. Like Stephen A. ain't the only person. Rick Bucher's been saying that yeah, for weeks Yeah, Bucher, now. right. Um, I will say that um, 
Duran's business manager, Rich Kleiman, who we've discussed mm -hmm. previously, yes. um, is ramping up his publicity um, run right now, and they're trying to do more things with him and put him out in front. So uh, read into those tea leaves what you will okay. about trying to continue to raise his profile, um, which will lead you to the idea of it being a, you know, the directing of a major media market and wanting to have his profile bigger in New York, even though he's yeah. from the New York area. So whatever, X, Y, and Z. Again, <laughs> you can like read into this <laughs> stuff all you want and get really I deep in conspiracy theories. Um, as a Knicks fan, it's cool. Um, I still, as a Knicks fan, have a feeling that somehow it will blow up spectacularly yeah, and be a complete disaster. But yeah, it's like it's kind of it's 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 almost surreal right now to think that in roughly a month and a half, like Knicks could be on the verge of landing Durant and then possibly some other major awesome mm -hmm. incredible piece. And depending what happens, you know, at the NBA draft lottery on Tuesday. Um, who even knows? And then you can get into the scenarios too of the fun hypotheticals of depending on what draft slot the Knicks are in. You could get Zion. Would you, if you get Zion or if you get John Morant or mm. whatever, depending on what slot you're positioned in, do you go after Anthony Davis hard? I like Anthony and Davis. And I personally would. I personally would. I like would. Anthony Davis in a Knicks uniform. I that feels would. right. Yeah. Like yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. of getting, the idea of getting, you know, KD the and then Anthony Davis and then someone else. Yeah. Because you can slide another max guy like, I take that over Zion and what the Knicks have and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But that's yep. a lot of Knicks fans saying that you would trade Zion or, you know, another top draft pick um, is sacrilegious and they want the high flyer that the Knicks organization has never really had. And, the, you know, the number one entity that that yeah. just has never been part of um, Knicks lore, certainly for the last 25, 30 years. Um, but again, debate for a different show and a different yeah. day. They could possibly do that, or they could trade for John Wall, and as a standard, Isaiah Thomas Knicks would do. We'll see. No, they won't. <laughs> no, they won't. No. Those days of, of laden sabotaging stuff of Isaiah just doing yeah, the most do haphazard do. Uh, you know, move of all time. <laughs> and like Steve Francis. And, and yeah. all of a sudden, like, you get word through your buddies, and you you log on and, and listen to Mike and the Mad Dog yeah, rant yeah, and yeah. rave about how Isaiah doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Like, those days seemingly are done for right now. Yeah. But That's Knicks so fans always have PTSD as long as oh, yeah. Dolan is in charge. And I have a Dolan story for you, though. I'll tell off the oh, air great, real perfect. quick. So. Awesome. Right, well, look, speaking of off the air, we're done. Thanks, everybody, for watching this special episode of Collider Sports Time. You know, we're not coming in as frequently as possible, but special stuff like this, I love to give time for previewing these conference finals in the NBA. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I want to thank Adam Caparel for stopping by. Adam, where can they find you, brother? Complex Sports. Obviously, postseason is our prime time, so pumping out plenty of hot takes and other stuff. You know, we have NBA draft lottery uh, uh, primers coming up, mm -hmm. stuff with Zion, and we'll have, again, plenty of hot takes depending on what comes down the pipeline. And most especially, um, you will see the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, the quick little plug I'll give for us is that we're dropping our NBA Twitter rankings where we rank all 30 team accounts from 30 to number one. <laughs> ah, that's and great. that stirs things up to levels that you oh, couldn't yeah. even imagine on NBA Twitter. So on Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, it's one of our most fun things we do every single year. Mm -hmm. It's actually a big deal to us in NBA teams. Um, we're dropping that, and you will see NBA Twitter in a just a blur of activity and a yeah. hizzy and people getting their feelings or, or bogan and bra uh, bragging and boasting um yeah we uh the uh, 24th i think is the date yeah um, so be on the lookout for that great look for that if you think athletes have egos hang around some nerdy social media oh managers. Yeah, it's like we get like, I, egos yeah, like we, you when, when i'm covering games like they ask like what yeah. are the rankings coming out like oh you know do you see this tweet we put out like yeah, how yeah. about this one for consideration like the no nba surprise. teams really really care yeah. about this competition ain't just for athletes yeah. all right thanks everybody for watching this episode of sports time you can follow me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram and like i said uh, please uh, subscribe to collider sports time on the youtube feed and on the podcast feed helps us keep bringing more and more of this content down the road for you take care we'll See you soon on Collider Sports Time.